enemy of apathy, purveyor of poignancy, <laughs> teacher, scholar, artist, jack of all trades, Renaissance man, Dr. Punya Mishra, please. I have this quote from John Cleese, uh, partly because I like John Cleese, but partly because it sort of connects with what I'm going to talk about. Um, this idea of creativity as, as not being a talent, but as a way of operating. And I will speak a little bit more about that um, as we go on. So anyway, um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I've, I've been here all day today. I had some wonderful sessions with, with, uh, with students, with faculty members. Uh, there's some great conversations around what it means to teach, what it means to be an educator, uh, what it means to use these, these new tools and devices that we have all around us and how we can be thoughtful and judicious in how we use them. And uh, tell you a little bit more about myself as Mark has left anything else to say, but anyway, um, since I have it in my slides, I have to go through it, right? So, okay, so, so my dream, and I've shared it with some of you before, it's to be on The Simpsons. And um, that's what I would look like if I were in The Simpsons. It's pretty good, right? Um, there's a website. You can actually go make your own Simpsons character, so that's kind of cool. Um, I am at Michigan State University. Go Spartans. You know, uh, just had a big football game where we beat our rivals U of M nicely, uh, which was good. And my son goes to U of M, which was doubly good, so that we beat him. Uh, <laughs> um, I also direct our Master of Arts in Educational Technology program, uh, which is a program which we spend actually quite a bit of time talking about this afternoon. Um, I'm interested in a whole bunch of different things, um, you know, issues around education and learning and teaching. But, you know, I have a background which goes to, you know, I have an undergraduate in engineering, left that and went into visual communications and design with an idea of making educational film, got interested in technology, you know, started working with the Mac. You know, so at that time, I sort of started seeing some of the possibilities there. And I'm talking of when computers were made of straw, so this is way before many of you guys uh, your time, all right? So, but it was, and sort of, you know, interested in aesthetics, psychology, engineering, all of those things and how they, they play out together. Um, most of my sort of work has actually focused, specifically in my research, has focused at this intersection of technology and education. What does it mean to use these tools in, in teaching, in learning? Um, so as an academic, you know, I, this is the sort of stuff I do. I study how people use these tools and technologies, and I write journal articles about them, which end up being read by like six people. Um, you know, so at some level, I am a researcher. But as I was thinking about coming and talking to you guys today, and, I, and Mark had told me that he isn't sure what the audience would be like. He's made this open to the community, and I had no idea who would be here. Um, so I said, you know, let me today not speak as a researcher and speak rather as somebody who's a parent. As somebody who has two children, I have one who's a freshman in, 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 at the college, uh, and one who's uh, um, a sophomore in high school, a son who's in college, a daughter, sophomore in high school, and thinking about what does it mean? What is this journey that has brought me to this point of thinking about their education, their life, their future? And through that, for us to reflect on what does it mean to be in this world today that we live in, right? And, and the future that we don't know. So quickly, a little bit of sense of my journey um, getting here. Uh, uh, this is where I was born in the eastern coast of India. Um, went to school in the northeast for a couple of schools there. Ended up in New Delhi, uh, where I got my high school, uh, my undergraduate degree in engineering. And this was the turning point of my life, which is that I joined this center called the Industrial Design Center, where for the first time, all these different things that I've been interested in, like literature and art and science and math and, and technology and all of that sort of came together in this degree in design. And that's when I realized that I need to understand more about how we as humans learn. And so I took a flight and ended up at the University of Illinois, um, where I got my PhD, ended up at Michigan State University. And these are the two kids who sort of, you know, um, the two people, they, were, they don't look like this anymore. They're all pimples and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, not really. They are pretty good looking, handsome kids. I could but you know, at some level, watching them as they have gone through school and thinking about that has sort of given a, a, a sort of a layer of, you know, complexity to my thinking about education because it's no longer this abstract thing that I'm a researcher and I'm thinking about what kind of cognitive structures do people have in their heads when they understand a scientific concept. It is about their coming home and my asking them, "So what happened today?" Nothing. It's like that's not even possible. How can nothing have happened today? 
you know. So anyway, so they joke about me and my wife, and that's an acronym I don't know if you've heard of. This is like Indian kids who's, uh, you know, um, so we call them this. We call these kids who are sec like first generation American but originally from India. They're called American born confused desis. <laughs> so A, B, C, D, that's what we call them. And my kids hate that. You know, it's like, no, stop it, you know. And desi is basically a slang word that Indians call each other. You can do it, we can do it, something like that, right? So. My son turns it on me and he says, actually, Papa, it's the other way. It should be DCBA because your Desi is confused by America, <laughs> right? And so for the longest time, you know, we were, this was an interesting point. I'd been at Michigan State for a bunch of years. My kids were growing up here. We were sort of embedded in the community and so on. But I sort of held on to my Indian citizenship. And it was partly, you know, that this is who I am. I'm, am I, you know, it's sort of, am I giving up a part of my identity by doing so? But here's the interesting thing that happened. I was being invited to come and talk to audiences like this all over the country. And then when I would talk, I would always say, this is what we need to do for our kids. This is what we need to do in our schools. And I realized that some kind of a mental bridge had been crossed, that, that I, when I was in India, I would talk to my wife and I'd say, you know, I'm homesick. I want to come home, which is kind of weird because when I was in the US, I was saying, oh, I haven't been home in a while, and I meant India, right? So I mean, it was this interesting mix. But it was, I think, more than anything else, this realization that since my kids are growing up in this country, since I am spending my time working with teachers and educators in this country, that there is a stake here that I put in into making this the best that it can be. And so we went ahead and got our citizenship. Uh, that's what my kids look like now, at least a year or so ago. Pretty good looking, right? Um, <laughs> And thinking about, you know, as they graduate and the move on in their lives is preparing them for a future that I can't predict. You know, there's this element that you want to protect your kids from all of this, right? So from change, and you want to prepare them for the best, and you know that you can't. And so that sort of brought me to thinking about what is this thing that everybody talks about these days, this thing called 21st century learning. You know, you hear that everywhere. You know, are we preparing your kids for the 21st century? We should have been asking that question in 1980 and not in 2014, because then at least we could be preparing for the 21st century. Now we're in the middle of it. And I've, in fact, worked on a panel which wrote a report, and I was still struggling with this idea. What is this thing called the 21st century? 21st century learning, what does that mean? And so like any self-respecting academic, I went and did a Google search. Um, <laughs> Got 23 million hits and 0.23 seconds. Um, so one of the things that comes up is very often is this, you know, that 21st century kid means somebody, you know, talking about 21st century, the new generation, the millennial generation, the digital generation, that it's all about these devices and their brains are wired differently and so on and so forth. Um, when I look at what it, when people talk about 21st century learning and teachers, it would be things like this. You know, current tools like blogs or wikis or apps. You know, and I said, oh, this is, this is easy. I figured out what 21st century learning is. So what's the key takeaway? Now think about it. A century is 100 years. But the takeaway that I got from reading this stuff was that 21st century learning will depend on early 21st century technology which means what's cool today is going to be for the next 100 years is what's going to determine learning in the 21st century. So I said, okay, what would that experiment look like if I went back 100 years? What if I looked at the technologies that were around in 1914 and see how they influenced learning and education in that rest of the century? So again, going back to trusty Google, right? So some cool things came up. You have crayons, vacuum diode, color photo. Now, crayons are a wonderful educational technology. We still use them. You know, anybody from three years old to 93 year old can use crayons, right? But to say that crayons would be the future of all 20th century learning, that's a really stupid idea. <laughs> if you think about 1903, the Wright brothers got on a plane for 40 seconds or 43 seconds or something that way. By 1950s, grandmothers were being tucked in as they flew across the Atlantic. I mean, so to think that the tools and technologies that we have in 2014 are going to determine all of what the 21st century learning is, is clearly missing the boat. 
And clearly what 21st century learning in is has to go beyond the newest and shiniest thing. And so that set us on this task with one graduate student. We said, you know, what if we did sort of a synthesis of what different people are talking about? So I'm talking about a little research project that we did. Um, <clears throat> so clearly we couldn't include all 23 million Google hits in our analysis. So what we did is we went with some really key frameworks and books that are out there. So you'll recognize Yang Zhao, who's over here in Oregon, uh, who used to be at Michigan State, um, Daniel Pink, Howard Gardner, Partnership for 21st Century Skills, OECD, all of these people have put forward their vision of what they think 21st century learning is. And so we ended up with a total uh, of 15 different frameworks. And we did a very high-tech analysis you know, with using some uh, really high-tech tools that we have at Michigan State. Namely, we cut them up in a little piece of paper, and two of us sat and moved pieces of paper around till we found some coherent sort of structures emerge, which is sort of the classic way of doing qualitative research when you think about it. You know, all the other stuff, you know, pull down menus and this, that, these are all fancy stuff for really moving pieces of paper around. And three big ideas emerge from that. And I want to share sort of these three big ideas, what they are. So 21st century learning. The first big idea that emerges from that is what we call foundational knowledge, okay? Foundational knowledge has three different components to it. It's core content knowledge, so knowledge of physics, knowledge of math, of music, of art, you know, core foundational content, subject matter areas that we teach in schools is still gonna be important. And that is obvious. If you're gonna be a chip designer, you have to know physics, you have to know your math. That's not gonna happen without that. The next big thing, of course, is digital ITC, ICT literacy, which is you know, knowledge of how to use these tools. Like that's foundational. If you don't know how to do that, you can't do a lot. And the third piece was cross-disciplinary knowledge. And I'll come to that a little bit more in the later part of my talk, but if you want to be a good video game designer, you know, not a profession that existed when I was growing up, which is kind of an interesting thing, but if you want to be a good video game designer, you can't just be a programmer. You have to be a programmer. You have to know architecture, design, visual design. Most probably, you need to know some theater and drama. Because the people who can best create an immersive environment are people who are in improv theater. With nothing, they can make you feel like you are in this world. And so if you want to be a good video game designer, it's not enough for you to know the computer side of things. You have to know the psychology of the individual. You have to know how to create these worlds which are immersive. That's a very different kind of set of mix of tools. So the three pieces that come up are in, in the foundational knowledge, are core content knowledge, cross-disciplinary knowledge, and digital and ICT literacy. The second piece that comes up in our structure, and again, I want to be clear, this is not stuff that we came up with. This is not Punya Mishra's view of 21st century learning. This is an abstraction from 15 of these frameworks. Okay? This is what the frameworks are saying. We just put it together. So what we call meta-knowledge, and these you will usually see when people talk of 21st century learning. They'll often talk about creativity and collaboration, um, creativity, innovation, problem solving, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. You'll often hear these terms thrown about. Right? But I think it's really important to see that this meta-knowledge is a way of acting on that foundational knowledge, which means creativity cannot exist in a vacuum. You cannot collaborate about nothing. So if you have to collaborate, if you have to be innovative, if you have to be creative, it has to be on certain foundational knowledge that you have around which you can do that. The third piece that emerges is what we call humanistic knowledge. And I was actually kind of surprised to see this because I wasn't really expecting that. I was, in fact, expecting most of it to be this, some that, and I wasn't really expecting this. And that was actually a very pleasant surprise because these are sort of the values that we bring to the educational process. So this helps us determine what is foundational, helps us determine how we act on that knowledge. And so there are, again, components to that which is you know, life and job skills, how to work with people, how to look ahead, plan, organize, so on, ethical and emotional awareness. You know, in a world where we are con consistently being distracted by things to be able to have self-regulation, 
for a child to be able to say that, you know, I need to finish my homework, and after I finish my homework is when I will check my text messages or whatever it may be. That's self-regulation. That's focus. Those are skills that need to be developed. We live in an increasingly global world. You know, a month ago I was in Chile. Now I'm here. I work with people who are spread out all over the world. Knowing how to interact and engage with people becomes really important. Understanding cultural differences becomes really important. So these are sort of the, the three things. The, so the three key pieces that emerge, what we call the knowledge that you know, knowledge how you can act on that knowledge, and the values that we bring to that process. So this was a framework, and we published this. I mean, I think it was published last year. Recently won an award for best paper, which is kind of cool. So the question then becomes is, what does this mean uh, for educators and parents to have something like this? And this was the first thing that struck me, was that if I would take this and I would present it to, let's say, John Dewey, you know, and I would say education is about you know, some knowledge that you need to know, know how to act on that knowledge, some values that he wouldn't like die of shock or something like that, right? He would be like, yeah, this is what's so new about this. And so that was wonderful. Well, that was wonderful because it told me that at some level, nothing had changed. That as educators, this thing that we are in, this activity that we are involved in has always been about this. It always has been about some foundational knowledge and some ways of acting on that knowledge and, and some values that we bring through that process, So, which was nice. Because very often you hear the rhetoric of 21st century learning. It's like, oh, we've got to throw everything out because the world is different and everything has changed. And that was nice to me to know that, that no, we don't have to throw everything out. That, that certain core things that we as educators hold dear going back will still hold dear. That said, I also understand that we live in a world which is full of things like this now. And this is me taking half an hour just looking up interesting images on Google. Right? If I had spent half an hour more, I would have 50 more images on there. But I think that we, as educators, as parents, we need to be thinking about what does, what does Minecraft mean? What does blogging mean or kid pics mean for me as a science teacher, as a math teacher, as a parent? What does it mean? All these different tools and you know, apps and so on and so forth. Then you combine that with social media user-generated content. It's a different dynamic. It's a different game that's being played here at some level. And so while I agree that you know, nothing has changed, that these core values and ideas still hold us together, at another level, I also feel that some fundamental shifts have also occurred. And it's finding that balance to me that becomes sort of interesting. So I was talking earlier today about the fact that some guy sits in a dorm room in Harvard, creates a software program, which has, what, 500 million users now, 2 billion users, Facebook, right? Somebody creates something like Twitter. And the best and fastest way we have of knowing when the green sort of election stuff happens in Iran is through Twitter. You know, these tools were not devised for these purposes. But this is the reality. Like what's happening in Hong Kong. And again, I'm not saying that this is always a force for democracy, not at all. There are repressive forces, the NSA watching, reading each of your emails and my emails, recording everything that I'm saying, you know, so that they can search and find through it. Those are flip sides of it. But the fact of the matter is that the kinds of things that are possible have changed very dramatically. There is a certain difference in that. When I was growing up in India, I used to, I, I love to read, you know. But the only two good libraries were the British Council Library and the USIS Library. And they were halfway across the town. And so once every month, I would have these two bags of books, and I'd get into this Delhi Transportation Authority bus, and first and shaken, and you get there an hour later, all sweaty and dirty, and then you go. And you return those books, and you pick up another eight or 10, and then you go back. You know, so information used to come at me this way. I'd have to actively go and seek information, right? It wasn't, and you compare that to today. That's how it is. And so the issue is not that of getting the information, the issue of filtering the information, of judging the information, of deciding which to listen to, which not to. How do we do that? 
And it's not surprising if you have a situation like this that most people feel like this. <laughs> and that is an actual uh, statue in the University of Twente in the Netherlands. I mean, it's, it looks very lifelike, trust me. I was walking around and like, whoa. And again, I went back and checked. He was still there uh, <laughs> in winter. And so when I think about sort of the fundamental changes that have happened, I think the single biggest educational technology revolution that has happened in our lifetime is this one. I mean, the ability to access information. I said this earlier today. Never before in the entire history of human civilization has the ordinary person on the street with an internet connection, you have to give you that, ever had more access to information. It's that gushing thing, right? But that's an amazing, amazing thing. It's an amazing thing for all of us who are in education, for all of us who are parents. Because a huge bottleneck that of getting this information has sort of gone away. Now there are people who would say that that's all very good, but who's vetted that information? You know, when we had a textbook or we had like magazines and journals, there were editors and editorial processes and, and so on and so forth. I agree. I think this new medium will develop its own vetting process and so on. But more importantly, it also means that each one of us, as educators, have to be training our children to our students to develop those critical skills, to question, to judge, to make inferences, to double check so that you don't believe the first site you read, that you triangulate that with other information. So that brings me to uh, what I call my 23rd law of parenting. And that has to do with you know, that, that for facts go to Google, for wisdom come to me, OK? So I think that's a very important rule. And I use this with my teachers all the time. And so I say it's law of parenting, but it's my law of teaching as well. So first few days when my teachers you know, in my class will ask a question, I'll say, oh, that's a great question. And this thing is connected to the projector. I'll go on Google, and I'll look. Even if I know the answer, I will look it up. After I've done that two or three times, there invariably is a moment where one of them raises their hand and says, forget it. <laughs> you know, because they know what they, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to Google it right there. But how you use that information, what you do with it. So I, our family is a big fan of common sense media. I mean, my family isn't. I am, and my kids have been forced to be. So if they want to watch a movie, which is like rated R or something like that, they have to go on common sense media, read up about sexual content, violence, this, that, and the other, and come and make the case for why they should be allowed to watch the movie. So for facts, go to Google. That's fine. But for whether this is an appropriate movie or not, and this, that, and the other, come to me. That's where we can have a conversation. So I talked a little bit about sort of this framework for 21st century learning, which emerged out of um, our research that we did. In fact, we are doing a follow-up to that study, and I was talking to you, Mark, about that, which is we are doing a survey of educators across the world. Um, so if you go to my Twitter feed now, you'll find that it's all tweets about, please complete the survey, please complete the survey. And I've been twisting Mark's arm, so many of you might be getting an email um, to do that. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my current work and the work that I've been doing, which has focused on this circle here, which is this idea of creativity. So most people know of my work because of my work in technology integration. And I love that work. I think it's great, uh, particularly because it got me tenure and promotion and all the good stuff. People cite me all the time. They invite me to come and give talks. I mean, what could be better? <laughs> but that said, that, I think, lies at the foundation of everything I do. Um, but I've always been interested in this idea of creativity. I've been interested in how teachers can be more creative, how teachers can help their students be more creative, understanding where it is that ideas come from, and with a very pragmatic bent. I am not as interested in sort of the psychological attributes of people. You know, that 
you know, on the five factor scale on which factor are you higher if you are creative. I'm not interested in that because it doesn't help me as an educator. As an educator, I can control a few things. I can control the environment I have. I can control the kind of activities and assignments and readings I give you. So those are the kinds of things I'm interested in. So I also like doing wordplay. Can everybody read that? Yeah? Can you still read that? Isn't that cool? So that, those are called ambigrams. So that's an ambigram for the word ambigram, which also rotates on its head. But anyway, coming to creativity, when Newsweek was a magazine, I used to joke that every few times, whenever they felt that they were running out of stories, they would run a cover story on America's creativity crisis. You know, so there are two of them there. You know, but jokes apart, it does look like over the years, people who have studied longitudinally, and you know, and we can quibble about whether what they're measuring is truly creativity or not, and so on and so forth. Usually, when people are measuring creativity, they're looking at what they call divergent thinking. The classic example being, give you a pencil and say, can you come up with like 50 different ways of using this pencil? You know. Turns out it correlates pretty well with people who are creative. Of course, it, I think, catches only one part of the creative process, because the first part of creative process is the divergent thinking. The second part is convergent thinking, where once you have an idea, can you take it to its fruition, to its limit? OK. That said, there is increasing evidence to show that as time has gone by, longitudinally, the creativity of children in schools has gone down. And people have made the case, though one can never make a knockdown argument in this case, that a large part of it is because of sort of the testing regimes that you have developed, because of the large amount of standardized tests, reduction of freedom um, in schools, and so on and so forth. And that, to me, is, is, is quite problematic and tragic. Because for me, one of the strengths of the American educational system was this fact, was the independence of you know, thinking independently, was the ability of this emphasis on creativity and individuality. And I think Young Zhao talks about that quite a bit. And if you look at something like this, which is an IBM Global CEO survey, uh, which interviewed <coughs> over 1,500 CEOs across the world and asked them about key leadership qualities, the number one leadership quality that they emphasize is creativity. And so at one end, we have this trend of reduction of it. At the other end, this clear understanding that this is an important skill that we need to have. Now, of course, authors like Daniel Pink have argued that, that you know, the right brain qualities of inventiveness, empathy, joyfulness, and meaning will increasingly determine who flourishes and who flounders. So there's a lot of talk about this thing of creativity. And of course, creativity is big business also, right? I mean, so you have all these people who are willing to sell you books and workshops and tapes and DVDs uh, to make you more creative. But there are lots of challenges. And they're not small challenges. They're actually big challenges, because they don't even fit on the screen. They're that big. And partly because creativity is fuzzy. It's hard to define. We always talk of it in terms of, oh, it's subjective, and the beauty is eye of the beholder, so on and so forth. There's this famous case that went to the Supreme Court about pornography, and, and Justice Potter Stewart said, I know it when I see it. And so very often when we talk about creativity, that's, you know, we know something is creative. So what we wanted to get a little bit more analytic about that, and, 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 and honestly, the field of, research, of, of creativity research is sort of converging on a sort of a definition of it, uh, which is, so I think that the common sense idea that, you know, we can't define it or we don't have any kind of analytic way of thinking about it is sort of misguided. So this is sort of our take on it. So the first step, or a first attribute that a creative object, artifact, or an idea needs to have is novelty. It needs to be new. It needs to be different. So you can see fresh, unusual, unique, surprising, startling, so on and so forth. OK? But just because an idea is new doesn't mean it's creative. It also needs to be useful. So. That fork there is a very creative fork. <laughs> I don't see you choosing it to eat your salad with, right? So the first piece is novelty. The next piece is that it needs to be effective. Usually when we say effective, it will be things like necessary, logical, sensible, relevant, appropriate, adequate, sort of a, a, a cloud of words that we would use along with it. 
But there's another element to that as well. So these are three teapots that Don Norman, um, the psychologist and design theorist, sort of talks about. This one is a pot that teapot that he uses on an everyday basis. It's got this little cute design where if you tilt it, you know the teas will the tea leaves will sim, and if you put it straight, you know then if once you have it strong enough, you know you can put it straight and so on and so forth. There is this one which is designed by some famous designer. He keeps it so that he can show off to people that you know he's a cool collector of teapots. The best one is this one. If you see the spout is aimed the wrong way. If you try to pour out of it, you'll burn yourself. So it's a useless teapot. So how does that connect with when I say that a creative design should be useful? And I think it connects by the sense that a creative design is useful within a specific context. That there is sort of a contextual, stylistic element to a creative idea, which, go, which has to come with so what we call whole. So if you think about the Zune as a music player versus the, the iPod. There was a certain, and it's not just the design of the device, it was iTunes, the fact that you could buy songs for 99 cents. I mean, it is this whole constellation of things within which that creative idea works. And so very simply, we talk about a creative product as being new, that's novel, effective, and whole. So just have a nice little acronym and creativity becoming a goal-oriented process of developing solutions that are novel, effective, and whole. So the question is, where do these new novel, effective, and whole ideas come from? And for that, we go to the great guru of creativity, Steve Jobs himself. And he says, creativity is just connecting things. And my response was that. <laughs> because if it was that simple, I would be Steve Jobs. You know, so clearly there is more to it than that. This is Maria Popova. She runs this website called Brain Pickings. I don't know how many of you know of this website. If you don't, I really recommend going and taking a look at it. She has created a career out of curating interesting books, ideas, art, science on the web. And she has this newsletter that goes out every Sunday. It's just an amazing. Uh, there was a beautiful profile of her in the New York Times about somebody who took her wide range of interest and actually created a career for herself out of nowhere. It's amazing. It's really interesting. It doesn't take ads on her site. People just, you know, whatever you feel like donating, you donate. And she, you know, she says, I make a decent living. It's not a lot of money, but I'm okay. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, so she says that the creative process itself will never be easy. This crux of combinatorial creation, that magic moment, she says, cannot be forced. So what does that mean for us as educators? I mean, what can we do? Right? What can we do if this moment cannot be forced? But this is the next thing she says. She says, we can, however, optimize our minds for combinatorial creativity. So maybe the role that we can play is that of optimizing our minds by enriching a mental pool with diverse, eclectic, cross-disciplinary pieces. So that, to me, is a possibility. So this idea of combinatorial creativity, that creativity comes from our ability to take things that are there in the culture around us and put them together in new and interesting ways. And that ability to do that comes from a broad base sort of understanding and knowledge of many diverse fields and, and, and practices. In our writing, we have jokingly called it indisciplined learning, because I like bad puns, partly. But partly because it's saying that that learning needs to be grounded in a discipline. You cannot be creative as a musician if you don't know music. But you also need that little extra something which is going to be, make you different from the other musicians. Right? So there is in a discipline at one level, but also in discipline. There's a little bit of chaos to that mix. And so this ability to be both in a discipline and outside of it. So when we talk about learning for the 21st century, usually we get like these two views. You get, built, I use these guys as sort of, scapegoats or straw men, because they're both friends of mine. 
So this is Bill Schmidt. He's the big shot who does all the third international math science studies internationally. He is out there in Washington, D.C., arguing for more algebra and arguing for more trigonometry and more foundational math and science so that our kids can be you know, good in this competitive in this world. And then you have, on the other side, my good friend, Yang Zhao, who used to be at Michigan State, like I said, now he's here in Oregon. And he is all about creativity and collaboration and, you know, and we should forget about the common core and, and all that sort of stuff, right? So he loves that. And so these two guys actually had a debate, which is kind of interesting to watch. I think it's online somewhere. You can find it. But I think that this is sort of a false dichotomy because disciplinary knowledge is important. So I agree with Bill Schmidt at that point. We can disagree about how much it should be. Because without disciplinary knowledge, disciplines, we cannot see the world. We cannot parse the world. Physics allows us to see the world in certain ways. It gives us purposes for that knowledge, methods of inquiry, forms of representing that knowledge. And that's true of art and music and geometry and what have you. And so this was a book that was written in 1943, I think, by Rosamund Harding. And so she says in that, that without the rock of knowledge, genius has no foundation. So knowledge of these foundational things is important. But then she goes on to say, originality depends on new and striking combinations of ideas, and says not only the more he knows about his own subject, but the more he knows beyond it of other subjects. And that, I think, is a very critical clue for us of how to think about this balancing the discipline and the indiscipline. So this extraneous knowledge to produce new and original combinations of ideas. So this is like a quote by Julia Andrews saying that some people regard discipline as a chore. For me, it's a kind of order that lets me fly. Goethe talks about that in his poetry. He says, when I write rhyming poetry, I always surprise myself by what I'm writing. Because some word rhymes with something else, and it takes my mind in some other direction. So discipline, in that sense, is also important. And here's Einstein talking about Dostoevsky gave me more than than even Gauss in sort of his way of thinking. And so this distinction that we make between foundations and creativity, art, and science, I think is one that clearly in my work, I'm seeing more and more as being a false distinction. And I'm, I collect examples of this all the time. And I'm going to give you a few examples. This is Alexander Fleming, famous for discovering penicillin. OK? That thing you see there. That's a painting that he made using bacteria. OK? And those bacteria are actually transparent solutions. So he takes a little Petri dish, and he paints with it. Then he puts it in the oven, lets it, then it comes out, then he does. If you go online and look, there are ones which he has made in color, which means he had to think about which color of bacteria would react with do what at what time. And so he says, I play with microbes. And one day when. He was doing these games with microbes. He noticed that microbes were not growing at some place. Others had seen that. They had people had gone back and looked at lab notes for other scientists. They saw that thing, and they did not see it. It's because he had been playing with it that he could see a pattern and say, there's something wrong here. That led to the discovery of penicillin. So discovery of penicillin didn't happen because Fleming was just sitting there. It was a lifelong. And if you read his biography, he's always messing with things. Nikolai Tesla, his amazing ability to imagine entire machines in his head. And he could do this funky thing like switch on, switch it on, and see how it play, and then realize that it gets stuck here. So oh, this part isn't working. In his mind, take that part out, rejigger it, and put it back, and let the machine work. And I wonder about how many opportunities we are giving our kids in schools today to play. How many opportunities are we giving kids to imagine? Again, not every child is going to grow up and become Tesla. That's not the point. Firstly, there might be one or two who might, who we are losing in the process. But more importantly, this is an intellectual muscle that each one of us can develop. And this, I think, is truly one of my favorite ones. This is the mathematician physicist Boltzmann reading Maxwell's work on the dynamical theory of gases. I'm not going to read the whole quote out to you. 
But it's important to know that Boltzmann was also an amateur musician. Think of, look at how he is describing a set of mathematical equations. I mean, there is drama, right? It's a little play, it's, it's a little song, whatever that's being enacted here, right? And how often do we talk about mathematics in this way? With analogies to music and so on. The, the examples I've given so far have always been sort of from art going into science. The thing is, it works the other way too. You know, this is sort of, you know, one dimension, two, three dimensions, four dimensions, and so on. The math's behind it. It took somebody like Salvador Dali to make this hypercubicus, this painting, where he used this four-dimensional representation as a way of speaking to the spiritual. The issue is not whether you agree with his religious leanings or spiritual. That's not the point. The point is that it's a wonderful piece of art where you see the two-dimensional squares here, the three-dimensional cubes, and the fourth-dimensional hypercube. More currently, this is the person who won the Nobel Prize in uh, chemistry last year. Says, I owe it all to my bassoon teacher. Speaking about this teacher who was influential. These three people, when the, that was in biology, I'm sorry. These three are in chemistry. None of these guys ever work in a chemistry lab. They work in computers and doing pattern recognition and so on and so forth. These are my four favorite examples. This is from this year. So the Fields Medal is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. Okay? Of these four, only one person fit the profile of the classic mathematician who sits down and does problems, even though not 100%. And that was this guy. This fellow grew up in Canada, used to visit India, is originally from India, used to visit India, and was to sit with his grandfather who used to teach him about Sanskrit poetry. And he loved sort of the rhythms and stuff of Sanskrit poetry, started learning to play the tabla. In fact, it's good enough that he does like almost quasi-professional performances and always talks about math in sort of musical terms. In fact, he says that math should not be regarded as a STEM discipline. That's what's killed it. He said math should be taught as a fine art. Just as we do painting when kids come in and they paint, we should teach math that way. Yeah, do something with numbers. Let's see. Let's look at pattern. Let's think about it deeply. That's his point. I mean, that's his point of view. I'm not saying that's what we need to do. But that, that is the point of view of an incredibly successful mathematician. <laughs> This gentleman here, at one point when he was 17, was working both with computers and maths, was not sure whether he wanted to go into computers or wanted to do mathematics. Developed this program that would do audio manipulation, sort of MP3 manipulations and stuff that way. Then finally decided to become a mathematician. Years go by, and he's working on a mathematical problem, which is a big problem in the field that he cannot figure it out. And one day an insight strikes him that maybe the, what I did with those packets, with those MP3s, can apply. So he runs to his wife and says, do you think this will apply? And she says, if this is right, we have changed this field of mathematics forever. And so they go and pull down books on MP3 and coding and so on, and guess what? They changed that field of mathematics forever. Got the Fields Medal. First woman to win a Fields Medal. Iranian, lives in the US now. The way she does mathematics, she does this mathematics of multiple manifolds. I don't even claim to understand it. But the way she does it, she spreads newsprint on her floor and just draws diagrams of lines and curves and, and does that for hours on end till the insight strikes her. And then she goes and does the actual rigorous work of writing the mathematical proof down. So example after example after example of people who exhibit what we call transdisciplinary thinking. And there are studies to show that people who are the most accomplished in the sciences, in the mathematics, typically have interests and avocations outside of their interests, which they claim has helped them become more creative in their profession. The question is, what does this mean for teaching and for teachers? And so we looked at these teachers who were National Teachers of the Year Award winners, people who end up at the White House shaking hands with the president, you know? 
And these are all their interests outside of teaching. It's a fascinating dissertation. And the title of the dissertation is, and I'm just going to give one quote from there, is we teach who we are. And that these outside interests, so there's a teacher who loves music, and he's a rapping mathematician. So he writes rap songs about mathematics to get his kids interested in math. Somebody who's trained as a graphic designer and teaching something else brings that into their teaching of biology. And so what we found is that just as in the most creative scientists, the most creative teachers have this ability to take their outside interest and use that to feed their energy in their professions, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. And I think she, uh, Dana, who did the dissertation, asked uh, these teachers that were you ever in your teacher preparation program asked about what your outside interests are and that you should connect them, and the answer was no. So I started with this quote, right? That creativity is not a talent. That yes, there always will be people who are incredibly ultra smart and ultra this and ultra that. But for most of us, it is a way of operating. It's a way of being. That's what's important. And that finding the balance between these different things. And the reason for that is, as Pasteur said, that chance prepares a favored mind. A prepared mind, sorry. That if we are prepared in not just our domain, but an ability to look across domains, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but to have an avocation which can feed into your vocation is a powerful thing. A mind prepared for combinatorial creativity. And sadly, instead of that, we see a lot of this, NCLB. This is a school district next to where I live, Lansing. They recently cut 87 jobs. That happens. The bigger problem was that all of these jobs were in arts, music, and PE. And I love science as much as the other guy. I mean, in fact, I love science maybe more than the other guy. But I know one thing, that my research and my reading and my thinking has shown that if you want to build STEM, you have to have the arts, an integral part of it. And so that's why this is so tragic. That's why it's so short-sighted. And it sort of is a poverty of the imagination on our part, on our part as a nation, as, you know, as a set of priorities that we have. So I'm going to come close to the thing to end this. I just want to share this with you. Can everybody read that? Art. So art and science. Now guess what? Education. Yay. How cool is that? And again, I want to emphasize, I love science. I love math. But I think, I think that if you want to become, create better scientists, better engineers, better mathematicians, we also have to nurture these other things. That's how we're going to keep that, that creative idea and spirit going. Thank you very much. That's my contact information.